Well, hello, this is Vincent Green, and today in our Bible and devotional reading, as we're reading through the Bible in 52 weeks, uh, this is day number three, and we're reading through the Bible to Genesis to Revelation. Today we'll be reading through Genesis chapter 9 to Genesis chapter 12. Chapter 9. Then God blessed Noah and his sons and told them, Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth. All the animals of the earth, all the birds of the sky, all the small animals that scurry along the ground, and all the fish in the sea will look on you with fear and terror. I have placed them in your power. I have given them to you for food, just as I have given you grain and vegetables. But you must never eat any meat that still has the life blood in it. And I will require the blood of anyone who takes another person's life. If a wild animal kills a person, it must die. And anyone who murders a fellow human must die. If anyone takes a human life, that person's life will also be taken by human hands. For God made human beings in his own image. So now be fruitful and multiply and repopulate the earth. You can see here that God, after the flood, after uh, Noah and his family had come off the ark, that God had changed some things. They now could eat meat. They now could eat um, uh, different animals for food, just as they had been eating grains and vegetables. Things had changed. God had made this change for them. And so you see the sovereign act of God. But you cannot eat any meat that still has the lifeblood in it. You need to kill it uh, before you can eat it, not while it's alive. And, and it needs to be cooked. Um, eventually, in Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, more stipulations would be given to the nation of Israel um, that would be that would give them more parameters and more details in regarding to what God is saying here now. But also God placed a price on human life that you're not to murder a fellow human being. And anyone who murders a fellow human being must die. If anyone takes a human life, that person's life will also be taken by human hands because God is the creator. And so God is laying out stipulations because he knows that the sinful inclinations of mankind still remain. That hasn't changed. Men are still born in sin, still needing of a Savior to redeem them and save them from their own sin. Then God told Noah and his sons, I hereby confirm my covenant with you and your descendants, and with all the animals that were on the boat with you, the birds, the livestock, and all the wild animals, every living creature on earth. Yes, I am confirming my covenant with you. Never again will floodwaters kill all living creatures. Never again will a flood destroy the earth. Then God said, I'm giving you a sign of my covenant with you and with all living creatures for all generations to come. I have placed my rainbow in the clouds. It is the sign of my covenant with you and with all the earth. When I send clouds over the earth, the rainbow will appear in the clouds. And I will remember my covenant with you and with all living creatures. Never again will the floodwaters destroy all life. When I see the rainbow in the clouds, I will remember the eternal covenant between God and every living creature on earth. Then God said to Noah, Yes, this rainbow is the sign of the covenant I am confirming with all the creatures on earth. So God continues to speak. He makes a covenant with Noah. This kind of covenant is to promise that he would never destroy the earth again with a flood waters, with water. He will wipe out this world with fire, but not with a flood of waters. And whenever you see the rainbow in the clouds, when you ever see the rainbow in the sky, God places that rainbow there 
to remind us of, of, of this promise that He has made, to remind us that He judged the earth with a flood of waters. Every time you see the rainbow, you should think about the significance of, this, of, of these chapters in Genesis regarding Noah and the flood and what God did during the flood. It's to be a reminder to us even today that God is real and that what He says is true. The sons of Noah who came out of the boat with their father were Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Ham is the father of Canaan. From these three sons of Noah came all the people who now populate the earth. Well, after the flood, Noah began to cultivate the ground and he planted a vineyard. One day he drank some wine he had made and he became drunk and lay naked inside his tent. Ham, the father of Canaan, saw that his father was naked and went outside and told his brothers. Then Shem and Japheth took a robe, held it over their shoulders, and backed into the tent to cover their father. And they did this. They looked the other way so they would not see him naked. When Noah woke up from his stupor, he learned what Ham, his youngest son, had done. And then he cursed Canaan, the son of Ham. May Canaan be cursed. May he be the lowest of servants to his relatives. Then Noah said, May the Lord, the God of Shem, be blessed, and may Canaan be his servant. May God expand the territory of Japheth. May Japheth share the prosperity of Shem, and may Canaan be his servant. Noah lived another 350 years after the great flood. He lived 950 years, and then he died. This is a very interesting story. Um, of Noah after the flood is done, starting in verse 20 till the end of the chapter. I've dealt with this in our inductive journey series of the book of Genesis in much more detail. But what you see here is that Noah is not immune to sinning. What he did was a sin. What Ham did was a greater sin. And God has a plan throughout all of this, even though in spite of all of their sinning, there's a plan here. And it's captured in the statements that Noah makes. Chapter 10. This is the account of the families of Shem, Ham, and Japheth, the three sons of Noah. Many children were born to them after the great flood. The descendants of Japheth were Gomer, Magog, Madai, Javan, Tubal, Meshech, and Tiras. The descendants of Gomer were Ashkenaz, Riftha, and Togarma. The descendants of Javan were Elish, Elisha, Tarshish, Kittim, Rodamin, Rodanin. Their descendants became the seafaring peoples that spread out to various lands, each identified by its own language, clan, and national identity. The descendants of Ham were Cush, Mizraim, Put, Canaan. The descendants of Cush were Seba, Havilah, Sabta, Rehama, Saptika. The descendants of Rama were Sheba and Dedan. Cush was also the ancestor of Nimrod, who was the first heroic warrior on earth. Since he was the greatest hunter in the world, his name became proverbial. People would say, This man is like Nimrod, the greatest hunter in the world. He built his kingdom in the land of Babylonia, with the cities of Babylon, Erech, Akkad, and Kalne. From there, he expanded his territory to Assyria, building the cities of Nineveh, Rehoboth Ir, Kala, and Rezin, the great city located near or located between Nineveh and Kala. You see, Nimrod. Nimrod becomes like the next world leader. He wants to be the world leader. 
He builds kingdoms. Not only cities, but he builds kingdoms. He wants to be the next great one. His name became proverbial. People who would want to aspire to be like Nimrod. But you know what happens to Nimrod? Like everyone else, he dies. Those who seek to uh, elevate themselves above God never succeed. Mizraim was the ancestor of the Ludites, or Ludites, Anamites, Lehabites, Neftuhitites, Pathrusites, Kasluhites, and the Kaphtarites, from whom the Philistines came. Canaan's oldest son was Sidon, the ancestor of the Sidonians. Canaan was also the ancestor of the Hittites, the Jebusites, the Amorites, Girgashites, the Hivites, the Archites, Sinites, Arvadites, Zimarites, and Hamathites. The Canaanite clans eventually spread out, and the territory of Canaan extended from Sidon in the north to Gerar in Gaza in the south, and east as far as Sodom, Gomorrah, Adma, Zeboim, near Lasha. These were the descendants of Ham, identified by clan and language and territory and national identity. You see the peoples expanding and, and scattering. Nations are being formed, people groups, cities. Sons were also born to Shem, the older brother of Japheth. Shem was the ancestor of all the descendants of Eber. The descendants of Shem were Elam, Asher, Arphaxad, Lud, and Aram. The descendants of Aram were Uz, Hul, Gether, Mash. Arphaxad was the father of Shelah, and Shelah was the father of Eber. Eber had two sons. The first was named Peleg, which means division, for during his lifetime, the people of the world were divided into different language groups. This is a story that comes in chapter 11. His brother's name was Joktan. Just a, a note where it says Eber. Eber is uh, the name that would eventually be applied to the people of Israel, Hebrew. They're the Hebrews, descendants from Eber. Joktan was the ancestor of Almodad, Shelef, Hazar Maveth, Jera, Hadaram, Uzal, Dikla, Obal, Abimao, Sheba, Ophir, Havila, Jobab. All these were descendants of Joktan. The territory they occupied extended from Misha all the way to Sephar in the eastern mountains. These were the descendants of Shem, identified by clan and language and territory and national identity. These are the clans that descended from Noah's sons, arranged by nation according to their lines of descent. And all the nations of the earth descended from these clans after the great flood. So you, you learn that there are people being born and, and, and groups are going out and, 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 and they're living in certain areas, certain land areas as the population increases. But in chapter 11, we learn about this story that divided the people in terms of languages. How did that come about? At one time, all the people of the world spoke the same language and used the same words. As the people migrated to the east, they found a plain in the land of Babylonia and settled there. They began saying to each other, Let's make bricks and harden them with fire. In this region, bricks were used instead of stone. Tar was used for mortar. 
Then they said, Come, let's build a great city for ourselves with a, tow a tower that reaches into the sky. <coughs> this will make us famous and keep us from being scattered all over the world. But the Lord came down to look at the city and the tower the people were building. Look, he said, the people are united and they all speak the same language. After this, nothing they set out to do will be impossible for them. Come, let's go down and confuse the people with different languages. Then they won't be able to understand each other. And that way, the Lord scattered them all over the world and they stopped building the city. This is why the city was called Babel because that is where the Lord confused the people with different languages. In this way, he scattered them all over the world. Wow. A lot to be said here. Uh, we've gone through this passage in our Genesis inductive journey and looked at it in detail. Even though Nimrod's name is not mentioned here, he's behind all of this. He's involved in all of this. And they wanted to build for themselves a great city. They cared nothing for God, for God's word, cared nothing about the flood that had taken place a few generations before. Even Noah was still living during this time, even though he didn't live there. But God did not allow that to happen. The way God judged them was by scattering them, giving them different languages so they could not understand each other. This is the account of Shem's family. Two years after the great flood, when Shem was 100 years old, he became the father of Arphaxad. After the birth of Arphaxad, Shem lived another 500 years and had other sons and daughters. When Arphaxad was 35 years old, he became the father of Shelah. After the birth of Shelah, Arphaxad lived another 403 years and had other sons and daughters. When Shelah was 30 years old, he became the father of Eber. And after the birth of Eber, Shelah lived another 403 years and had other sons and daughters. When Eber was 34 years old, he became the father of Peleg. After the birth of Peleg, Eber lived another 430 years and had other sons and daughters. When Peleg was 30 years old, he became the father of Ru. After the birth of Ru, Peleg lived another 209 years and had other sons and daughters. When Ru was 32 years old, he became the father of Serug. After the birth of Serug, Ru lived another 207 years and had other sons and daughters. When Serug was 30 years old, he became the father of Nahor. After the birth of Nahor, Serug lived another 200 years and had other sons and daughters. When Nahor was 29 years old, he became the father of Terah. And after the birth of Terah, Nahor lived another 119 years and had other sons and daughters. And after Terah was 70 years old, he became the father of Abram, Nahor, and Haran. Abram would eventually become Abraham, and notice in his lineage, Eber is one of his ancestors. So, Eventually, the Jewish people that would come, the nation of Israel that would come from Abraham, would be known as the Hebrews. Isn't that interesting? This is the account of Terah's family. Terah was the father of Abram, Nahor, and Haran. And Haran was the father of Lot. But Haran died in Ur of the Chaldees, the land of his birth, while his father Terah was still living. Meanwhile, Abram and Nahor both married. The name of Abram's wife was Sarai, and the name of Nahor's wife was Milcah. Milcah and her sister Iscah were daughters of Nahor's, brothers, Nahor's brother Haran. But Sarai was unable to become pregnant and had no children. One day, Terah took his son Abram, his daughter-in-law Sarai, 
his son Abram's wife, and his grandson Lot, his son Haran's child, and moved away from Ur of the Chaldees. He was headed for the land of Canaan, but they stopped at Haran and settled there. Terah lived for 205 years and died while still in Haran. Chapter 12 But the Lord had said to Abram, Leave your native country, your relatives, and your father's family, and go to the land that I will show you. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you and make you famous, and you will be a blessing to others. I will bless those who bless you and curse those who treat you with contempt. And all the families on earth will be blessed through you. Now we get introduced to Abram, who will eventually become Abraham. We see that God makes a promise to him and for him to leave his native country, leave his relatives, leave his father's family. It's a picture of how God calls us out of this world to follow him. So Abram departed as the Lord had instructed and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he left Haran. He took his wife Sarai, his nephew Lot, and all his wealth, his livestock, and all the people he had taken into his household at Haran and headed for the land of Canaan. When they arrived in Canaan, Abram traveled throughout or through the land as far as Shechem. There he set up camp beside the oak of Moreh, and at that time the area was inhabited by Canaanites. Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, I will give you this land to your descendants. And Abram built an altar there and dedicated it to the Lord who had appeared to him. After that, Abram traveled south and set up camp in the hill country with Bethel to the west and Ai to the east. There he built another altar and dedicated it to the Lord and he worshiped the Lord. Then Abram continued traveling south by stages toward the Negev. At that time, a severe famine struck the land of Canaan, forcing Abram to go down to Egypt, where he lived as a foreigner. As he was approaching the border of Egypt, Abram said to his wife, Sarai, Look, you are a very beautiful woman. When the Egyptians see you, they will say, This is his wife. Let's kill him. Then we can have her. So please tell them you are my sister. Then they will spare my life and treat me well because of their interest in you. And sure enough, when Abram arrived in Egypt, everyone noticed Sarai's beauty. When the palace officials saw her, they sang her praises to Pharaoh, their king, and Sarai was taken into his palace. Then Pharaoh gave Abram many gifts because of her, sheep, goats, cattle, male and female donkeys, male and female servants, and camels. But the Lord sent terrible plagues upon Pharaoh and his household because of Sarai. Abram's wife. So Pharaoh summoned Abram and accused him sharply. What have you done to me? He demanded. Why didn't you tell me she was your wife? Why did you say she is my sister and allow me to take her as my wife? Now then, here is your wife. Take her and get out of here. Pharaoh ordered some of his men to escort them. And he sent Abram out of the country along with his wife and all his possessions. You see a contrast in this chapter with Abram. God makes a promise to him, brings him into a land that he has promised to him that his descendants will live in. I will give this land to your descendants, God tells them. And Abram's worshiping the Lord. But he loses sight of of God and God's protection and God's promise to him and goes to Egypt. And you can see the disaster that happens. He compromises. He puts his wife in a vulnerable position. You could you'd be asking yourself, how in the world could he do such a thing? It tells us, it's a picture to us 
of how, even as a believer, it's difficult to live in this world and to fall prey to sin. And we must watch out for it. We must be on guard against it. There's so much here in this story. But in the end of it, God still protects Abram and Abram's wife. We learn so much from reading the scriptures. Let's pray. Dear God, we thank you for this opportunity to read your word, to focus on these chapters from Genesis. Lord, we pray your blessing would be upon us as we read and study the Bible, as we devote time to saturating our hearts and our minds with your word. Your word is eternal. It will never pass away. It will never fade away. You have the words of eternal life. So Lord, thank you again for this opportunity to read your word, study your word, be able to understand it. May you receive all the praise and all the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.